Okay. So let me write again the SIR model and for, for reference. There's this famous epidemic curve for the number of infected. It's just something like that, which has a peak. Okay? We want to know how to characterize this peak. Okay? So the peak is where the derivative of i with respect to time is zero. This means that I can take this second equation, beta times s times i times and divided by n minus uh, uh, is equal to zero. Okay? Which will give you s over n times beta equal to a, which implies s over n is equal to a over beta, which happens to be 1 over r0. Okay? So the peak happens when the number of susceptibles has attained this value. But there's a nicer way to, to, uh, to discuss this. This is, remember that the total population is composed by s plus i plus r. Now, what is how many uh, individuals have been already infected? Okay. It's the recovered, because they can only be recovered if they haven't been infected, have been infected, and the infected. So I will call this by another letter line J, like this. This is the total number of people that have been infected on the course of the epidemic. Okay. So then, therefore, n. Uh, n is equal to s plus j, and then therefore s is equal to n minus um, j, and I can use this here, and then I will get um, n minus j divided by n is equal to 1 over r0, which implies that 1 minus g, j divided by n is equal to 1 over r0, which is j by n is equal to 1 minus 1 over r0. The total number of people that have been infected uh, uh, is equal to 1 minus 1 over r0 at the time of the peak. Okay? So you get the infections. And they start to decrease when they uh, arrive at this threshold, which happens to be the herd immunity threshold. Okay? Okay. So, and this is the basis of the discussion that we had uh, at the end of the first class. Okay? So, herd immunity has been introduced at vaccination, but actually the same threshold appears for the number of people that have been infected when at, at the peak. You when you turn from increase to decrease of the, of the um, epidemic, and then, this, uh, then you have this, okay? But now the point is, uh, we don't know I, okay? Because the number of people that are infected, uh, you never have this, this, this plot. The number of people that are infected at a certain time. Active, it's called something active infections at a certain time. We know the new cases per day. So, how many new cases per day do we have looking at this equation? Anybody can tell me? New cases per day. Yeah. 
Yeah, beta, th this guy, okay? It's not I, because I is the balance of people that come in from the new cases, but they get out due to, to um, recovery. But this here, they can only leave here and go here. Therefore, the number of new cases per day is beta si over n. The sign is obviously not important. Well, so now we want to know, and this will give you also a number of new cases, but we have also something like this. And there will be a peak. Question, is this the same peak as before or not? Could be different. In order to know where this peak, if this peak is the same as this peak, we have to find the value of the, we have to find the maximum of this function. Therefore, we want to calculate ddt of beta si over n. Okay? As beta and n are constants, I, I, I only need to calculate this, okay? And put it equal to zero. Okay? And this is not difficult. It's just the train rule, ds dt times i plus di dt times s equal to zero. Now, ds dt is minus beta over n s times i therefore you have s i squared plus d i the t has two terms at this one and this one so the first one is beta times um, s uh, s i over n this one, plus s times the term, which is minus a minus a s i equal to zero. That's the, that's the, um, the equation. We can simplify this equation, dividing everything by, um, by s times i, therefore I have beta over n. s times i leave you an i here plus beta times um, s over n minus a is equal to zero. Okay. So therefore s over n at the peak is equal to a divided by beta plus i over n. Okay. This one is 1 over r0. And this one, we don't know but it's positive. Therefore, we compare this situation here with the situation that we had before. This here is smaller than this one, okay? Because this is the old one plus something, okay? Plus something. So, it means that the uh, this peak has more susceptibles than this peak in the, in the system. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's going a bit too fast. Can mm. you explain it again, please? So, uh, what we want is to know the number of susceptibles or of the covert at the peak of this curve, okay? This curve is given by beta si over n, the num number of new infected persons. Because that's, that's written here. It's, it's the, 
this term here is the term that drives S to decrease. Therefore, this is the people that are getting infected per unit time. So you have to find the derivative of this. Okay? So the derivative of this is uh, you don't need the beta in the end because they are constant. And we will find the derivative equal to zero. So you, 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 you just, the peak does not depend on beta and n here. Therefore, you want to know the peak is when the derivative for s times i is equal to zero. Then you calculate ds dt times i plus di dt plus s equal to zero. That's the derivative. Okay? And then you substitute ds dt and di dt from the equations, which are here. So the first one gives you, you have the i times ds dt. ds dt is minus beta over n times s times i. And then the second i here is i, I squared. Here, I need di dt. di dt has the first term, which is beta times s times i divided by n, which multiplied by s gives you a, a squared s. And then there's a second term, which is minus a i times s. Here, this is equal to zero. Then I divide everything by s times i. Then this goes away. This, you have s over n beta, and this one will have um, beta over n times i. And this is the equation. So now, I calculate s over n. s over n will have, um, have a divided by beta. That's the same calculation we had here. Plus something. Okay. I have I have divided everything by beta, so that that there's here this 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 something. So this is one over r zero. Okay, beta over a is r zero. So this is one over r zero plus something. Now, this was the condition for the peak of the variable i, and this is the condition for the peak of the number of new infected persons per unit time. And so, the value of s divided by n and s over n at this peak is different and the value of s over n of this peak. One is one over r0, and the other is one over r0 plus something. Okay? So the number of susceptibles in, this, in, the, in the population is bigger in this case than in this case. So the peaks are not the same. So if the number of susceptibles here is bigger, and the susceptibles can only decrease because they have a negative derivative. Here, this peak has more susceptibles than this one, means that this peak is before this one. Okay. So if you, if you monitor the number of new cases per day, you have this, this, this uh, curve here, um, then, if, when you, if you are going through the peak, doesn't mean that the, that the number of new, of the number of infected people is decreasing. It will start to decrease later only. It's not the same peak. Okay? So this has before than this. Okay? The number of new cases start to diminish, but it takes some time until this, uh, the number of active infected people um, uh, decrease. Okay. So, so as you see, the, the peak for the variable i is connected to the, the same tr threshold of, of the herd immunity uh, thing. Okay? And this one is not, it's before. Therefore, there has been a lots of confusion with COVID, and people 
just have we just have this from the data. And then people say, say that, well, it's starting to decrease. We are at the, at the threshold. Now, it's not the same threshold. It's not the herd immunity threshold. Okay? It, it, it will be attained only later. Okay? So this was a confusion that was widespread in, in not, not in academic papers, but in, in, in general opinion. So, now let us move, move from the SIR model okay? uh, and look at other models. And I will just develop one of them, the other one I will pr project the results. And then we have a general discussion about uh, how models should look for different diseases. Okay? So. One of the simplest cases to discuss is a disease or the I can you please um, go uh, back uh, to uh, the other you want it back yeah. <laughs> I did not quite understand the um, the herd immunity peak thing, um, because does does that does it take into consideration how much time people um, get immunity f after infection? I didn't. So here we we have the people that get the infection. And there's a certain duration of the infection, then they get immune. And in this model, this is forever, the oh. immunity, okay? That's, that's forever, okay? Because there's no way of getting out of R, okay? We could have, and we may, I, will, I will show you how to do, uh, uh, systems where you can have, uh, 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 I'll say, uh, waning or a decrease of Im immunity and get ex susceptible later. But here, it's, it's everyone is immune. Right? And this is, well, this, is, this here, this value is the value when the I starts to decrease. Okay? So the number of infected people starts to decrease. What I'm uh, uh, discussing is that we don't have this curve from data. We have this curve from data. Okay? And this curve has also a peak, but it's not the same peak. It is before. Yeah. <coughs> and that other, that Oops. other, <laughs> no, no, it's okay. The other calculation that you did there with the other peak is also considering uh, eternal. Yeah, like, it's the same. Immunity. It's the same equation. Okay. It's the same equation. So. Uh, one is important with this uh, thing is uh, there could be a different model that this calculation could still hold, but if you have people from R flowing back to S, the, the, the calculation is different. So one of the simplest models, which is even simpler than SIR, which can be solved and so on, is the model with susceptibles and infected and back. Zero immunity, okay? No immunity, okay? So the most cited examples are like, like, uh, like gonorrhea and bacterial, no immunity. So this is easy to write, okay? So we all have DSDT will be minus beta SI over N, the same thing, and we will have DIDT being beta SI over N, but now this guy 
goes away from here, but reappears here. Therefore, this is the model. Okay. So, this are two equations for S and I, which are coupled. However, S plus I is the total population, which is constant. Therefore, I can substitute the variable that I want. For instance, I can take S is equal to N minus I and substitute this here and get an equation for I. So, what will this, this will give you? Substituting this, we will have di dt. Beta times i divided by n times n minus i. Then minus a i. Nice. This is beta i um, one minus um, i over n minus a i. This is which I can rearrange. I can rearrange this in the following way. Let's write the linear term. And I times beta minus A. This is this first term and this one. And then you have minus beta I squared over N. And this is, now I, I, I put in evidence beta minus A. I will have beta minus a times i. I put in evidence also here. Um, okay, let, let's just write this way. i1, which is this term, minus beta over beta minus a. Uh, i over n. And then I notice that this here is the logistic equation. Okay. okay, this is what was the previously the R. I one minus I with some coefficient, that's the carrying capacity. Okay? So it, it turned out to be the same equation as the logistic equation. And then we know that this goes to the carrying capacity. Yes? <laughs> so the dynamics of an SIS, this is called an SIS, uh, epidemic, goes to a carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity is 1 over this. Okay? carrying capacity, so the fixed point, which is the asymptotic dynamics, is at i, at the, at the point, is equal to the carrying capacity, which is beta minus a over beta, which is 1 minus 1 over r squared. Okay? So, there is this new fact. Now, what's happening is that over the time, you don't get zero infected. There are always a, a level of infection. So this is a, what's called an endemic uh, uh, state. There's no, no no burnout of the, of the epidemic. You have the solution, you have the dynamics, 
when, uh, when the number of infected people following a logistic. Logistic? That's the dynamic. At the kind capacity. Right? So you never you never go to zero. Right? And and obviously uh, S is that directly cal you can calculate S from from, from this. Yeah. So at then you could then you could ask the question in in this model can I know if there are a class of people that even Capacity. There is a class of people that has not uh, gotten the infection. So you could think about this. But first, you, you see, this is this is i. Uh, sure, sorry, this is i over n. So the proportion of of, uh, of infected uh, people and at the at the at the endemic state is one minus something, okay? So it's not, if it were one, everybody would be infected all the time, okay? But it's not. If R, the larger R, if I have big R, zero, then this gets, gets smaller and smaller, you will approach a state where everybody is infected. But if R is not uh, so big, let's say it is, uh, two, then this gives you one half, means that one half of the population is infected all the time. Now, the question of that, are there people that have escaped, is not possible to answer with this model. Because you can be susceptible, e even having, having been infected. Okay, so uh, there's no distinction in this model between the two susceptibles, let's say, and the susceptibles that are recovered, uh, that, that, are, that have lost immunity. Okay, so there's no distinction. So this is, uh, is uh, therefore it's not possible to say if everybody was infected or not with this. Okay, so. Now let me, let me use the, 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 the computer. We have discussed it up to now. Uh, this situation where the population is constant, but you can imagine a situation where the population is constant, but there are people, there are newborns, and there are people dying. If this more or less compensates, still it's a good idea to have the population constant. But it could be important effect that you have an inflow of new susceptibles, that the people that are, uh, are, are, um, are giving uh, birth, then new susceptibles. And then you have people dying, getting out of the class of, uh, in fact, it's, I mean, dying at, at, at all the um, classes. Okay? So that's called, in effect, it's called demographic effect. Okay? So the idea is, how do we take this into account with an SIR model? Okay. How do we, and what will be the effect? So just, uh, we, we can imagine what will be the effect in the sense that SIR model is, is this epidemic curve with, which goes to zero, okay? Goes to zero. The, the, uh, the number of infected people it goes to zero at the end of the pandemic. Now, if there are always new susceptibles, because 
because of, of, of birth, then they, they could uh, uh, be infected again and again. So you are replenishing the, the, the compartment of, of susceptibles. So one thing is maybe this means that we won't have a, a, a state which is free of infection at the end of the epidemic. So let's see how to model this. So, so I'm using this one other. So you see here, oh, I forgot my point. Well, uh, you see this is just the same uh, uh, model as the SIR model. I'm not writing the N because I'm, I'm it's not very important actually. It is, this is um, uh, S, I, and R in this, uh, in this slide represent the, the fraction of susceptibles, the fraction of, uh, of uh, in, uh, infected and the fraction of, of uh, recovered. So you have the first, uh, let me use it here. You have this first equation here. So this is the infection term that we already know. You can see the, yeah. The, the. This is the same thing as before. And this A times I is the same thing. This is the, the, the infected people that are going to the recover. And now I put a mortality term, people that die, at the same rate at, as um, uh, for susceptibles infected and recovered, the same rate. So this is not mortality due to infection. It's not virulence. It is the natural mortality in the population, which is independent of the, in, of the epidemic. But then I want the system to have a constant population. Be and this is obviously a, an approximation but the, because the number of people that, that the, 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 in the system is the, is the, uh, uh, the balance of birth and death. Maybe it's not com complete. You see the population increasing, but you have to increase user of population over, over 10, 20, 30 years. Maybe this is a long scale of time, much longer than an epidemic. And uh, so it's a good approximation to say that the population is constant. Therefore, I'm, I need this equation to have a constant population. So if I sum up all of them, let's do it on the blackboard. If I sum up the three, I will have this. And so you see this term here cancels with this one in the sum. This term here cancels with this one. And then what remains is mu times s plus i. R, which is happens to be n, or in this case uh, it's one, okay, because it's a fraction. And therefore, I have to add the term equal to mu to the uh, equation for susceptible, which represent the birth of new susceptible, in in such a way that birth and death balance it maintain the population constant. So this is what is called an SIR model with demography. And this changes a lot of things. So if, uh, I don't want to do too much calculation, but in this case, you can um, find the fixed point, as we have done in all the ecological problems and so on, and calculate the stability of the fixed point, and then you get this, this. So this is the endemic state. Now you have an endemic state in the SIR model with demography. So there is an equilibrium with uh, S uh, at this value, I at this value, and R at this value, which only exists if R0 is 
bigger than one, which is uh, the usual conditions. Hmm? The, uh, which one? There's no reason to be. No, let me see. Maybe it's. Uh, well, it's not exactly the same. It's, it, 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 no, no, it's not the same principle. Yeah, this is this is a completely different. This is an S I S model. No immunity. This one has oh. I immunity, but has people has birth and death. So they are Im people can get immunity. Here they don't get. So, so you get this fixed. Both, oh. both are fixed points in endemic states, but in different like situations. Yes, this one is a, 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 a graph like this, where there's no no compartment of recovered. Uh, this one here is a, is would, would represent the same as our arm that we have. But with demography, which is the fact that you have people, new susceptibles uh, appearing due to birth. So you have again an endemic state. The origins of the endemic state uh, are different. Uh, biologically, well one has to do with the lack of immunity, and this one has to do with the demographic effects. Right? But both represent uh, the replenishment of the susceptible pool, the, the compartment of susceptible, getting again individuals, and this is what can actually um, um, say. Uh, sustain uh, uh, an equilibrium which will be endemic. It com comes from the fact that that uh, that uh, you have some way of having new susceptibles which can sustain more infections. The curiosity here is it's it's nice. Then you could say, okay, I, now I want to say this, see the solution. You can do this numerically. You can also look for the fixed point and, and stability and so on. And it's, it's nice because the solution is oscillatory. With decreasing uh, amplitude and uh, uh, going to the fixed point in the same way we had with, um, for instance, in the rosenzweig macarthur uh, case when the, when the carrying capacity was uh, low, then uh, uh, we approach a fixed point with oscillations, with decaying or damped oscillations. So here you have the same. Yeah. Is the oh. Can this damped term be found analytically, analytically in this case? Uh, in, in understand. Uh, Can this fix the, the point damped term, like uh, the, the the what the damped? Uh, yeah, yeah. behavior yeah. can do you have it analytically analytically for this model or no. No? no 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 okay no you can I think you can calculate the period but the I can, period I, yeah, yeah uh-huh I, I yeah. can't remember okay. now how to do this but not not so easy but not the decay itself no. okay yeah. no uh, thanks I think well it would be a nice nice uh, nice mathematical problem is to uh, look instead of looking at the curve you see that it's kind of curve that uh, of the of the peaks here. Uh, that's uh, that that curve is called the envelope. And uh, maybe you can write down an approximation of the solution, saying that maybe you have something oscillating, and uh, you, you try uh, oscillation with just sinus, and then you find an, uh, the. Um, the equation for the amplitude, and maybe there could be the possibility, I've never seen this, there uh, could be the possibility of, of uh, getting analytical, analytically the decay rate. Mm. So this is, is, it represents what? This represents recurring epidemic 
wave, epidemic waves which go with decreasing amplitude. Yeah. One, one other situation which is similar to this one is if we have the SIR model and I go from here back to here. I, I, there's loss of immunity. If you can have the situation where you don't have the, uh, uh, eternal immunity, then this is a system would not be difficult to, to write down. Let's, let me write it down. But it's a little bit messy to do the calculations. But just to show you. So this would be an SIR model. Let me just oh, here. That would be an SIR model. But there will be a flux from here to there with a certain, I would usually, it's people leaving the class of, of recovered and going back to the susceptible. This is the SIRS model, which a solution for this is similar to the one I showed on the on before. It is goes to an endemic state, and um, and it uh, uh, approaches a fixed point true oscillation. So it's practically the same uh, thing. Okay. So one question would be. So w with this two. Uh, uh, two situations. One question would be, are there uh, epidemics which have sustained amplitude of, of, of recurring epidemics, which are sustained, not decaying amplitude? That could be, could be a, 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 a legitimate uh, a question about the, uh, you could, Think, for instance, like influenza. So you have influenza every year, more or less. Okay, so uh, and doesn't seem to have a uh, less and less uh, uh, epidemic. Uh, the number of people every year getting infected is not decaying. Okay? So obviously, this case of influenza has pretty much. Um, particularities because it's not the same virus every year, but if you call the virus, all of them are influenza, and effectively you don't have, uh, you have lost immunity. Okay, it's 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 if it were exactly the same virus, then obviously then you you, you would have immunity. But as this thing, the influenza virus has a very um, strong uh, turnover of mutations and actually it's not the same uh, uh, from year to year it's a little bit different and therefore that the, which allows for immune escape and um, so the uh, so it is it is similar to SIR yep perhaps it was infected recovered after some time you lose immunity, which means that you are, it's not exactly loss of immunity, but it's effectively, because the different, different, you are not immune to the mutation. Okay. But uh, SIR, S model has oscillations for this is recurrent epidemics, but it has decaying amplitude, like the one that I discussed before. 
So there must be some mechanism to sustain this, this uh, uh, the recurrent epidemics beyond just this, this idea of loss of immunity. It's not enough to explain why you have sustained situation. Okay? And, um, well, one thing is that the dynamics of respiratory, uh, highly infected respiratory uh, um, uh, infections like influenza is pretty much dependent on seasons. So there is, there is a much higher transmissibility in certain seasons. This is not necessarily valid for tropical regions. But for temperate, it's well known, right? But even, I mean, you don't need to go to examples like UK, Germany, right? the, even here, Sao Paulo. I mean, it's it's much, it's much, uh, much uh, colder in the winter than in in the than in the, than in, than in the summer, and uh, there is the, a connection between. Winter and and epidemics of influenza, and uh, this means that the transmission dynamics is is easier in the winter, which means that the the transmissibility, the beta, should depend on the season, and therefore beta should be a function of time. So one way would be to, to have this same as I arm as the one, but with beta, depending on time, with a certain with a period of one year oscillating. So beta should be something like this. Okay? Representing the fact that you have more transmission in the winter. When you plug this into these equations, then you obtain oscillations, recurrent epidemics, which have a constant amplitude, do not decay anymore. Okay? Do not decay. So this is, is an example, but here clearly you need um, to understand what is the mechanism that sustains this recurrent epidemic. So in this case, it's clearly the season. So you can have this kind of sustainer thing. Um, it is, it's, 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 it's something that is not uh, so obvious. Is why is there an increased transmissibility connected uh, to the winter, to the case of influenza? So why do you think there is more influenza uh, cases in the winter than in the summer? People stay more indoors? That could be, but not, not, not necessarily. Some other ideas. The immunity grows? No, I, I mean, you, you mean immunity should probably not depend on the temperature, I mean, on the season. There, there's an interaction of, of, of climate and immunity, I don't think so, but uh, I, I don't know if this is possible. The virus is more stable. Yeah, so there, and there's a dispute about these two views. There is, for, for you expect to have a, um, an, an effect in and uh, connected to the people who stay more indoors. But clearly, thi this, this is clear for if you live in, I don't know, in, in, Holland, in France. But it's not so clear for people, for instance, in, in, in the, not necessarily, in the tropical region, the influenza dynamic is a little bit different, but subtropical, like uh, here in Brazil, for Sao Paulo and until, I don't know, Bahia and so on. The people don't stay so much indoors because the winter is mild. 
And then there comes the point is that um, the, the stability of the virus is dependent on temper temperature. The, the de degradation time of the virus depends on temperature, and it's natural. Higher temperature means more thermal agitation, which have effects on, on making the virus less stable and therefore less transmissible. But, on the other hand, in the winter, you have a colder uh, situation, the virus is more stable than in the So you have a junction of things, and actually, this is still debated. Okay? What is, the, what is the, the point, actually? That of in, and with, uh, you know, there has been kind of now a, a re-evaluation of all the transmission um, mechanisms of respiratory uh, um, diseases due to what has been disco discovered with, uh, with COVID-19. Because in the, in the World Health Organization, the common law was uh, all, all respiratory uh, uh, um, uh, diseases are transmitted by droplets, and uh, the droplets may f may may fall on on, on things. And then you can have um, touch the, the things and, uh, and get infected, or uh, or or being too close with somebody emitting uh, droplets and so on. So this was, no. now there are actually people that are not from the World Health Organization. There are people that usually are either are physicists or more, 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 uh, more, more frequently uh, uh, engineers, but study the dynamics of viral particles in there. Yeah. And what the, these people were, were in constant conflict with the people from medicine, actually. And it turned out that these people from engineering knew that there can be transmission with droplets, but there can also be transmission by aerosols, which are way, way more uh, 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 smaller than the droplets. droplets Sometimes you can see them or by reflection. Aerosols, you don't see aerosols. Okay. So if the, if the, and therefore, the mechanism of transmission may be different. Because, if, because why? Because aerosols float around. And this means that the, the contagion does not need to be by close encounters. Say I'm, I have COVID here. I hope I have not, but say I have. And OK, I leave this. And I come in somebody else. N didn't even see him. He, he can get from me. Okay. So this is, this is a point where it's really difficult uh, to, to I think there will be modeling efforts for this kind of situation where you, where the idea of contact is not so clear. Maybe you have to put a, a model like, uh, uh, for instance, models for, for uh, cholera. Do you have the susceptibles infected recovered uh, compartment with an uh, uh, an environmental compartment, uh, which is. Uh, uh, a virus load in in uh, in, in water, and uh, this is a compartment in the model. Maybe so uh, things like COVID. Maybe this could be an idea to to, to explore. Other models that are interesting is models where you have structures in the population. One of uh, they're, they're essentially one structure that is very, very important, which is age stru structure, which is important if the transmissibility or the susceptibility of the people uh, depends on <coughs> sorry, 
depends on age. We have seen this with COVID, with many, many diseases. The, for instance, death rate, um, influenza, influenza, people can die of influenza, but this is dependent on age. Usually we don't die, but then if you are 90 years old, maybe you can have a problem. Okay? So uh, these, uh, these structures pose an interesting uh, modeling uh, challenges because, for instance, if you want to have, say, uh, let's, let, let's say something simple. Let's say age, we have only two classes, uh, older than a certain age or, or younger, okay? So then you would have the susceptibles of, of, the, of the young, say, and the susceptibles of the elder, okay? And then you will have an equation for both of them. Let me write one of them. That would be minus, uh, minus beta si times, times what? The infected um, young plus infected elderly. Okay? But this is not correct because the transmissibility could depend on, on this, therefore, on, on the class. So the, therefore, you will have a beta 1 here and a beta 2 here, okay? And on what should these betas depend? This here is a term for young, which are getting infected by young people. Therefore, it depends on the contact rate between young people. And this one, depends on the contact rate of young with elderly people. So, and, and so on, if you have more classes, then more you need to know about um, contact rates between ages, which is not a problem of epidemiology anymore. It's a problem of social structure. Which, which shows that social structures uh, uh, have an importance. And uh, there are many other ways in which social structures have, uh, have importance. But it's an intrinsic uh, importance is that, uh, um, that uh, uh, the, the contact rates between ages can be different from contact with contact, for instance. And, uh, and also, if you have ages here, you will have uh, to know how many people are in each class, which is this uh, demographic, uh, how it's called, uh, a set of people call it is a pyramid, but it's not anymore. It's uh, the distribution of, of people in classes of age. So you have to do this. You need a <laughs> census in, in order to, to get uh, this kind of... Uh, of so this, these models can become pretty much complicated because they need as an input these contact rates. Are there systematic works on the contact rates between age classes? Yes, there are. Because in done by epidemiologists, which, which uh, I can't now say how they do this with a statistical approach, that they... Uh, Approximately, yeah, uh, having data from some countries, they ex extrapolate for other countries based on the distribution of uh, how many people are in each age class. And that's what actually is used when the people f do modeling uh, for, for, for decisions, for, for input for decisions in COVID-19, for instance. You, you need this, uh, to use this, uh, this, uh, this rates of contacts between ages, and you use this standardized uh, works that uh, have been done, I mean, have been updated recently. Which may be a problem because it would be better to have a measurement of contact rates between age classes. So this would require a population survey and long interviews. 
about contacts. And then th this is obvi would obviously be, you can do by sampling, you don't need a census, but you can do by sampling. But if you have a lot of, of age classes, then you need a lot of sampling also because you have to, each class has to have a, 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 a statistical significance. So this would be a, a, a problem that is, uh, for instance, in Brazil, uh, we don't have this. There has been a proposal of a friend of mine uh, from the from the political science department at the uh, University of Sao Paulo to do this kind of research, but she got no, for Sao Paulo, but she got no, no funds from, from, from FAPESP and so on. So uh, this was before COVID-19, and probably the, the, they didn't see the importance of this kind of thing. But it's very important, and there would be a, a real, uh, really, really good to have this, uh, because this, this contact rate also depends on, on the, well, depend on, on, the, on the behavior and characteristics of the society, but they could be different, for instance, uh, in, uh, in cities than in rural areas, or small cities, big cities, that could depend on this. Right? Knowing this kind of dependence between rural and, and, uh, and uh, uh, urban, uh, contact rates would be something very, very important. Now, another class that is important, maybe important, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, sex classes. Uh, uh, is um, if the person is male or female. So you can divide your population in subpopulations, but susceptible males and susceptible females and so on, then uh, if you are doing, uh, uh, why is this important? For instance, influenza is not important. Uh, it, uh, I mean, the, 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 the rate of uh, infection is the same from, for men and uh, women. Therefore, you don't need the class because it's, it's irrelevant. But could be, for instance, in, in sexually transmitted um, uh, uh, diseases. As I might mention, for instance, uh, one model that uh, has been viewed and it's not so difficult to analyze was, is for gonorrhea because gonorrhea doesn't have a uh, uh, recovery uh, state. But then you need the contact rate of, of, uh, of uh, males and females. But this can be highly variable. Because contact rate in this case means sexual intercourse. And this is a diff difficult, there's a whole distribution of, uh, of partners and of, of, of rates of contacts for people. And this is also very difficult to parameterize a model which has these ages, uh, this uh, sex uh, difference. Um, something, what people do is something is still, uh, I've seen works which, which are like this, that you have susceptibles and infected, you have males and uh, females, but then you have uh, uh, people in cl two classes, uh, very active and not so, not so active. And uh, then you need the contact rates between these classes, okay? Which means, for instance, you need to know the, the contact rates with people in the class very active, with the people in class, uh, class not so active. And this has to do with the network of structure of the, of the contacts because you could have people that are very active but they have much more contact with other people that have, are very active or could be also no, no, not the case people that have very active that have more contacts with people that are not so happy and active so uh, it is it's very complicated to, to, to put it to put this in I mean it's easy to imagine a model and people from network science, for instance, have, have been do doing epidemics on networks, which is an interesting subject, but it's kind, kind of mathematical because, because you have difficulties in finding parameters that are realistic for networks of contacts. It's a real mess. And therefore, well, you have nice results, and there are books on this, but still, 
uh, not so clear the how to use this and to, to, to analyze real world uh, uh, epidemics. Okay, so any questions about this? Yeah. Um, in the first endemic model that you showed us where we had no recovery, um, we reached a fixed point for the number of infected people. Uh, I thought that when you were going to talk about uh, vital uh, dynamics, you were going to talk about this case where uh, we have a fixed point for infected people, but you, then you showed for SIR. I was wondering how would this uh, vital dynamics affect our fixed point in the endemic case? Good. Uh, 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 SIS model with, uh, with demography. I don't know. I have to kind of do the calculation. But um, well, it, it, it probably will sustain will be easier to sustain it because you have two sources of new susceptibles. But um, I think that, I mean, this is a, can be calculated. It's a, it's, it can be an exercise. That, uh, it's easy. Uh, but probably the demographic effect happens on a scale much longer time scale than the effects coming from the fact that there's no immunity. That this probably goes much much faster. More questions? Yeah. Let me mind. Um, so I was wondering about a two species system. Right. A two species system uh, involving um, infection, but the infection only occurs from one species to another. How we will calculate the R0? Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to write down the. the so, so, R0, okay. So, you have two species. For instance, humans and mosquitoes, okay, and a pathogen. Two species, human, but when you usually in this case, for for, for human mosquitoes, for instance, uh, the, the you don't take into account uh, uh, much of the demographic dynamics like you do in ecology, you know? and um, well, you can have some some difficulty to. I mean, you have to think a little bit more about the R0. The R0 is the number of secondary cases that the initial case creates. But actually, you don't infect a human. You, you, you infect a, a mosquito. So you could say, I can have a, a R0, which is the, the number of mosquitoes each human infects. You could have an R0, which is the number of, of humans that each mosquito uh, um, in fact, and I can say, I can have uh, R0 similar to the one we have discussed here. When I say I have, I, I have a I human, I have infection, and this will create infection in humans, but through the mosquitoes. But then I say, okay, I don't care about the mosquitoes. Okay? They, they are just the vectors. Okay? And uh, if the mosquitoes are constant population and so on, it's just good, good thing that, well, maybe I just don't look at the mosquitoes and then I can have the, the human to human uh, uh, transmission in the, in the mediated, but, in the, in the, but then R0 is defined by how many humans, through the mosquitoes, a person has infected. Yeah? This is the how you define the R0 and actually it can kind of can show that this R0 is the product of the other R zeros that I mentioned. Something. So, Mo modeling with uh, with um, well, this didn't, didn't discuss here uh, vector-borne diseases. Uh, 
which usually have to do with either uh, mosquitoes or ticks or something like that, uh, is, is a very strong connection point between epidemiological uh, um, discussions and ecological ones or climatic ones. Because mosquitoes, for instance, do not regulate temperature. Therefore, their metabolism is dependent on temperature and on the seasons. And um, you, couldn't, you could have if effects, uh, this would, if different lifespan depends on temperature and humidity and the rainfall for certain mosquitoes. Um, transmissibility can depend on temperature also. And uh, so, for instance, you could pose the following question. Uh, malaria. Why is there no malaria in colder counties? There's no malaria in Denmark, Sweden, never has been. In Europe, only the Mediterranean, and it, essentially Italy, which has been eradicated for a long time, but there could be, there had been uh, in, in the malaria in the, in the Mediterranean uh, region. But you have malaria mainly in Africa, in, in, in South America, and in um, India. Don't know the situation in China, but always in the, in the, uh, the warmer regions, not in the cold. Uh, so why, you, why should this be? Why is there no malaria? Say, if you go to Uruguay, there's no malaria there. Yeah. Why? Yeah, so you can, uh, okay, there's obviously a, a point about the environment for the mosquitoes. For instance, the urban environment for malaria mosquitoes isn't, isn't good, okay? But, uh, but you could go to rural areas, to the at, uh, Atlantic forest, which is not urban, and uh, in principle you can have the mosquito there, the, the Anopheles. Hmm? Yes, so one thing is the, uh, is the mosquito turnover time in the population uh, can, and therefore the fecundity if you want, can depend on temperature and, and, that, and it's highly dependent. On temperature. And um, another thing which is very curious, which actually me, Paolo and Anato, we have a paper on this, or, is that you have to, you are sitting here, you have malaria, and there comes a mosquito and uh, bites you. There's a time for the mosquito, in the case of malaria it's very important, but it's also uh, important for other diseases. There's, there's a certain time until the mosquito gets infectious. So epidemiologically you would say that there's an incubation period for this. Okay? And it's actually a, a physiological process that in order to bite again and transmit, the, the virus has to be in a certain place of the, of the body of the, um, of the mosquito. This is called the extrinsic incubation time. Okay? And this thing depends a lot on temperature. And for malaria, there have been studies, uh, Pretty old studies because I think don't think they would be ethical today. Uh, yeah, because uh, yeah, but that I still use the results uh, about the um, intrinsic incubation time for Anopheles, for instance, and and the incubation time um, decreases uh, with temperature. So the idea is that higher temperatures, like the, all the metabolism of the, of the, of the, of the mosquitoes, is, is, is faster, and therefore also this is faster. Now, 
if the incubation period would be, uh, um, for if, it, if, if you go to a cold environment, then the incubation period, extinct incubation period, will be longer than in a warm environment. But could be that it's so long that you cannot, there's no time to infect a person. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's of the same order as the lifespan of the mosquito. Therefore, in the colder regions, for instance, if you go for the north of Ar Argentina, Argentina is not known as a country that had malaria, but actually in the border region with Bolivia and, uh, and in up to until Tucumán or something, you have the mosquito. There is the mosquito. There have been some epidemic, but uh, for instance, a little bit like, uh, I think it's Tucumán, you have the mosquito you have never had at the border with Bolivia, you have uh, had in the past epidemics of malaria. Now it's uh, eradicated, it's eliminated locally. But there are places where you have the mosquito and does not, do not have the epidemic. And then one ex possible explanation is it is already the, the region of transition where the, the, from where you can have or not the uh, transmission. And in this region, there's the mosquito, but uh, extrinsic incubation time would be too, um, too long. And the cycle of transmission, the chains, do not close. That's, that's, uh, that's um, a possible explanation. Right? So the the geographic, um, the geographic distribution of diseases is uh, when they are vector-borne, they are uh, pretty much dependent on climate. There's a very recent paper which is very uh, impressive, which is the following. You know, you have this, I have talked about this some, somehow, some, sometime. This, this, the, the fact that, um, uh, well, you have, this, you have climate change and you have this super big models that uh, run on from supercomputers for climate uh, dynamics. So you have scenarios for future temperature uh, and um, I think also rainfall uh, in the, depending on which uh, scenario, there are five, five or six scenarios. But this can be used in models of the geographic distribution of species, in particular of mosquitoes, which are vectors uh, of, of diseases, or not only them, and bat. But as the effect of climate change of the effect of temperature is very strong. There can be s situations where you would have the mosquito having to, I mean, it's difficult to say that the mosquito can adapt to a higher temperature, but they have to go for, they have to follow the range of temperatures where they can survive and uh, also the, the and, and, and this would also imply something about, about the diseases that they can transmit. So there are people that have done this and, uh, and, try and, and then well, then there will be species where, which will be able to change the, uh, the, the habitat and go, f go uh, sufficiently fast uh, the home range will be sufficiently fast uh, adapting to temperature and there are others that maybe not. The temperature changes and the species maybe will just get eliminated. Because not able to, through movement, to adapt to a, to a region. 
So there is this work, uh, which is super, super computational, which is uh, projections of what could happen in terms of hotspots for new diseases, hotspots for changing regions for certain diseases. Yeah. And um, so this is interesting because uh, the, the hotspot is, the main is, uh, is, uh, is southern, uh, southeastern Asia, which we already know is a, a source of many of the new infections. And this would be also an, a hotspot. And the other hotspot would be Amazonas, Amazonia. But if you take into account adaptability and the possibility of going from one environment to the other, then Amazonia is not anymore because so big and it's, it's, it's not so difficult to adapt for the, uh, you don't have, it's easier to adapt in Amazonas. And then it would not be a, a hotspot anymore. Okay? So depending, to obviously this is, this is uh, computational work, which has to be, I mean, uh, gives you a general view. But this is interesting that, uh, that um, and then if climate change has a, can have a clear and, uh, effect on not necessarily new emerging diseases, can also have, but, uh, but on the, the geographical place where you have certain diseases. And uh, one of the mechanisms is possibly that uh, the adaptation or not of certain species of mosquitoes or other vectors also. Okay, so if there's any more questions, then otherwise, okay, thank you.